Hello and welcome to Visa News. I am Jawad Hami, Pakistan's permanent representative to the United Nations. Ambassador Mr. Munir Akram has spoken at a high-level debate being conducted at the United Nations Security Council regarding the climate and food security impact on the maintenance of international peace and security addressing this particular high level debate and the august forum pakistan's permanent representative mr munir akram said pakistan attaches high priority to the strict implementation of the indus water treaty and aims to reinvigorate the indus river basin he went on to say that indian ba indus basin was the largest contiguous irrigation system globally providing food security to over 225 million people and to the invigorate this water body pakistan has launched the multi dimensional living in this project ambassador munir akram further said increasing water demand coupled with climate change impacts creates the potential for the trans boundary water disputes in several parts of the world he also alluded to the fact to the uh, rapid uh, depletion and the melting of the glaciers up in the north in pakistan as well saying that these glaciers are melting due to extreme temperatures at an alarming rate and this together with heavier monsoons leads to massive floods like the epic floods in 2022 causing damage of over 30 billion dollars he has also uh, cautioned against securitizing the climate and development agendas emphasizing that scarcity was the root cause of conflicts and sustainable development is the best means of conflict prevention the pakistani envoy also expressed concern over the lack of progress in reducing the emissions and providing adequate climate finance he emphasized the need for the developed countries to reduce emissions by at least 43% by 20 30 he also stressed uh, the need for mobilizing the estimated 1.5 trillion dollars annual investment for a transition to clean energy which remains a significant challenge he has also said uh, that despite the promises both the public and private investment in sustainable infrastructure in developing countries fall short with the 100 billion dollar annual climate finance commitment remaining unfulfilled in today's program we are going to talk about the indus water treaty also pakistan's commitment towards this particular bilateral treaty between pakistan and india that was facilitated by the world bank and how india had been violating this particular treaty and also what are the mechanisms when differences and disputes between the two countries uh, which is uh, which are parties to this particular treaty uh, come into effect also uh, we will be taking a stock as to the issues of water scarcity in pakistan and how it is currently affecting pakistan's population uh, the food security as well as what are the future threats related to this particular phenomenon and what sort of policies what sort of framework is required in that particular uh, regard and how crucial happens to the water management in that regard also the kind of effects of climate change pakistan had had in the recent past as we saw in the case of the devastating floods of summer 2022 and uh, what needs to be done uh in that particular regard we saw there were international commitments which were made by the international community there were certain calls by the united nations also there were a lot of pledges made but materialization of those pledges remains largely unfulfilled there had been a slow response to that also also when we talk about the food security uh, security issue how it is related to that particular phenomenon of high um, melting and rapid melting of the glaciers in Pakistan and ultimately what it will actually lead to also the kind of urgency that has been urged upon by Pakistan's permanent representative to the United Nations Mr Munir Akram urging the developed world to reduce their emissions by 47% by 2030 how that is doable why the developed world hasn't been able to take some concrete measures in that particular regard despite a lot of pledges and international agreements to that particular effect and why the promises of a 100 billion dollars climate financing also remained unfulfilled also we'll be talking about the connection between the impacts of climate and food security to the maintenance of international peace 
and security. For all that, we are honored to have been joined in the studio by Mr. Sayyid Abu Ahmad Akif. He's former climate change secretary of Pakistan. Mr. Akif, thank you very much for your time for being with us on the show tonight. Really appreciate that. Also, in the studio, we are honored to have been joined by Mr. Munir Ahmad. He's water and climate advocacy expert. Mr. Ahmad, thank you very much for your time. Also, for being with us on the show tonight. Really appreciate that. In the studio, we are also honored to have been joined by Ms. Naila Chohan. He's form, she's former ambassador and also special secretary on foreign affairs. Uh, Ms. Naila, thank you very much for your time for being with us on the show tonight. Really appreciate that. Let me begin the discussion with you, Ms. Naila, when we talk about Indus Water Treaty, the significance of it, what did it uh, basically signify when it came to the allocation of water resources between Pakistan and India, and how Pakistan had been committed to this particular treaty, given the fact there had been a number of violations on the part of Indian side? Well, uh, this question has many parts to it. Uh, if we look at how it started, uh, this region, South Asia, has the world's largest irrigation system, which was created by the British. And all the heads were left in India at the time of partition. So our dispute started from 1947, you could say. And from 48, we had further problems, and then started six years of negotiations after that, uh, the two sides agreed, Nehru and General Ayub Khan, in 1960, in September, decided to have this uh, Indus Water Treaty known as IWT, which was brokered by World Bank. So it was World Bank which was the guarantor. And as you know, World Bank and all these international organizations are basically, uh, they comprise member states. So it was Australia, Canada, USA, New Zealand. These were the countries that were behind this World Bank support. Consequently, uh, although in this water treaty had many lacunas because it is more on water sharing, not water management. So water sharing became an issue because the management part that we hoped would be played by the international organization, which is the World Bank. That didn't happen as uh, uh, efficiently as was expected. But it is still one of the best treaties in the world on water sharing. Now, having said that, you can see that in uh, uh, 2023, India decided to change the treaty. And they sent a note to Pakistan on this. Now, for Pakistan, it is imperative because like uh, uh, Ambassador Muni Rakram said at the UN, that this uh, treaty has multifaceted impact. It is on climate change because now we are talking of GLOF. And GLOF is basically glacier lake uh, outburst flooding. So if the warming that is going on with climate change, these gloves come in. And India, you can see in 1971 also, uh, when East Pakistan was created into Bangladesh, the main problem was that in West Pakistan, it was thought that uh, the water uh, uh, the then East Pakistan had always inundations and floods and so much resources was going there. But later on, World Bank confirmed that it was India that would release water in monsoon to inundate the people and have it as a political agenda. And even now, they are doing that because now that they have Article 370, uh, which was abrogated in 2019, they claim that Kashmir is now integral part of India. So all these waterheads in Kashmir would be controlled by India. So they don't need to have this treaty. So this is a very warped psyche because it is not only impacting uh, the two countries politically. It is matter of lives which will be affected 
by this mismanagement uh, or lack of sharing and then uh, on top of it the climate change. Uh, right, uh, Mr. Ahmed, what's your understanding of it, uh, the Indus Water Treaty and the Pakistan's commitment to its adherence and also at the same time uh, we see violations on the part of India? Uh, as uh, the topic is uh, introduced by Ambassador Naila and uh, I would take it uh, uh, to further because like uh, in that context uh, certainly uh, we always uh, face the water problem. Uh, in the dry season, they stop the water. They control the water and uh, they have uh, uh, built uh, uh, over 30 dams over there. And uh, on the other hand, when uh, it comes to monsoon, and they uh, discharge all the water to uh, these uh, uh, rivers and our uh, uh, entire country is flooded with. And uh, last year, we uh, faced $30 billion, uh, uh, you know, the uh, loss. losses. So this is the case. And uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, what they have, uh, you know, after the abrogation of uh, uh, the Article 370, they have like uh, trying to build more um, reservoirs over uh, the Indus Basin that they control. And uh, this would uh, certainly have uh, more impact on our agriculture uh, as well as like uh, uh, the uh, other uh, issues that uh, will uh, arise because of uh, the climate impact as uh, we are facing the brunt of uh, the uh, uh, impact. So uh, this is a really a uh, very difficult moment for us. And I believe like uh, this would further enhance the conflict, uh, uh, you know, a transboundary conflicts. Uh, right, isn't there any sort of a mechanism that is, that is there in the Indus Water Treaty if there is a sort of a difference that arises? Or, uh, first of all, a question uh, between the bilateral uh, parties arise regarding to any of the issue and further uh, there is a mechanism uh, of appointing a neutral expert uh, regarding that and later on if he deems that this difference is going into a dispute then there is also a mechanism of uh, having a court of arbitration right so what does that those measures actually provide in case if one party out of the two has issues or uh, deems that its rights are being violated? Uh, we have gone a couple of times to uh, international court uh, for uh, such kind of uh, dispute resolution, uh, but we could not uh, find solution to it. And uh, as uh, uh, Ambassador Nala mentioned that uh, uh, the uh, arbitrator, like the moderator of uh, the, uh, this um, agreement, World Bank has to uh, had man manage it. But, uh, uh, I must say like uh, uh, World Bank uh, could not manage the treaty because uh, uh, having a treaty between two and then after it's a long term uh, commitment to manage it according so that uh, both countries could uh, uh, meet uh, the water needs of both countries. At this moment when uh, India playing a very stubborn to uh, their stance, their like proclaimed stance. And certainly, uh, Pakistan has to emphasize on uh, international forums. And also, like, we need to engage consistently our uh, World Bank forums uh, to uh, mediate the conflicts. And I believe, like, uh, is international court uh, is uh, really a bit um, uh, difficult and tedious process. And uh, both countries uh, have to go for negotiations by third party. On the other hand, if uh, we see that uh, India never wanted to have uh, any third party mediation, uh, medi mediators uh, between uh, Pakistan and India to resolve any sort of disputes. So this stubbornness and this uh, rigid uh, uh, environment will not uh, resolve the issues. And it would create more chaos and it would en enhance the conflict basically. Uh. So I believe like there should be uh, some mediators to come forward to uh, resolve the conflicts. Mm -hmm. Not only the water one, the other uh, geopolitical issues are also be 
uh, addressed as well. Uh, right, uh, Mr. Agiev, now what's your understanding when we talk about the overall situation or, or overall phenomenon of water scarcity when it comes to Pakistan and how do you think India's violation of Indus Water Treaty actually exacerbates that particular problem here in Pakistan? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I think we need to see the whole global situation because nothing is static, everything is dynamic. The treaty is now 63 years old almost. And uh, in these 63 years, uh, I mean, we need to see, Ambassador Naila would second me, that uh, the world operates on realism. I mean, ha Hans Morgenthau, the, the, the f founder of realism in international politics, because morality is often the argument of the weak. And the world, I mean, as we have recently seen in the Middle East, international uh, law is very weak because primarily international law does not have a sovereign uh, implementer. So, I mean, having uh, whatever, I mean, having said whatever you, uh, about the treaty, uh, the fact of the matter is that Pakistan is a very poor utilizer of its resources. And when we go to the World Bank or any other person, they would always point out to our poor management. We only use less than 40% of the available water, one. Uh, the, I mean, the farm sector employs almost half of uh, Pakistan's employment, but it produces less 0.1 percent of the total tax. The abiana, which is the water charge, is, I mean, it's a joke. So we, I mean, uh, I mean, the abiana does not even fulfill 10 percent of the operation and maintenance cost of your resource. Then uh, there are other domestic factors. Pakistan has got almost 3% of the world's population, but only 0.5% of the world's water resources. India and Pakistan, uh, when we became separate, in the last 70 odd years, their water storage capacity is about 120 days. Pakistan's water storage capacity is less than 30 days. The global requirement is at least 100 days. We have not built a major dam in the last 50 years, ever since Nabela was operative in 1976. So we must look inwards also. I mean, 93% of our water is used by agriculture. And of this 93%, 80% is used by four crops, wheat, cotton, sugar cane, and rice. But these, the 80% use of water produces only 5% of the GDP. So the, que the, the questions for us are mostly domestic. I mean, the, globe, the world actually uh, retreats almost 50% of its wastewater. We treat less than 1%. So, I mean, we need to see inwards. I mean, notwithstanding the importance of international law. So, we, I mean, the, the we need to take a holistic picture so of the whole thing. So, when we take a holistic picture of it, and we, as you mentioned, that we should look inwards, where to actually start from when it comes to the better management of water uh, within the country? I mean, countries undertake issues as per their priority. Do we really think the water is our priority? I, I've, I've just mentioned one statistics, 80% of the water produces 5% of the GDP. The question is, it's, it's a political economy question. Should we be growing sugarcane? Our sugarcane is not very efficient. The sugar content of our sugarcane, as we move upwards from the equator, the sugar content decreases. So the, the, the real question is, why should we be producing sugar? We don't have a competitive in advantage in, in terms of sugar. So, I mean, we are one of the poorest uh, producers, users of water. For every unit of water used, we only produce $1.4 in value. So every statistic, I mean, and now, uh, I mean, pr uh, pr problematizing everything is climate change. We are one of the 10 most uh, vulnerable countries in the world. And, and one that of has actually exacerbated the situation? Because, I mean, see, at the time of, in 1951, uh, the first census of Pakistan had 33 million people. So, and now we have 240 million plus. So the population of Pakistan has grown more than seven times. The water resources have not grown seven times. So unless, I mean, uh, we are going to keep sink, if we are going to grow like this, no resource, because Pakistan had an availability of 5,000 cubic meters of water per person at the time of independence which is now down to less than 1,000. Primarily not because the water has decreased, but because the pressure on the water has increased. So, so we need to look inwards before we look outwards. 
because every international body will point out to these issues. So does that call for the population control at the same time? Also? Absolutely, absolutely, because our number one problem in Pakistan is the uncontrolled population growth and the uncontrolled urbanization. While, I mean, uh, urban water use is only 7%. I mean, all industry and all domestic use is 7%. 93% goes to agriculture. So we, we need to, I mean, have implementation of our policies. So, I mean, all this this whole mix is such a So, uh, given the fact mix. if there is a policy that is formulated and implemented in regard to controlling the population, so how to increase, where to look for to increase the water resources from? As gi uh, given the fact there is climate change in action also, we saw the devastating floods back in summer 2022 also, uh, as per this particular statement, and also talked about it already by so many experts of the field, that the glaciers up in the north, are melting at a rapid pace due to extreme temperatures. So we have to look for those uh, water resources to have more capacity. I mean, uh, it is said in Urdu that, uh, the, I mean, even in English we say that uh, the, the truth is often very bitter. And we need to face the truth. Our own national body, the NAB, estimates $133 million per day is lost in corruption. That's $48 billion a year. So, I mean, this $30 billion of damages as, uh, with the floods, I mean, why, 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 why doesn't our infrastructure hold? Because our infrastructure is very poor. So, we, we need to look in, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a proponent of looking inwards. Okay, when we talk about having the climate resilient infrastructure, for example, if that particular infrastructure is not holding against uh, the, uh, f uh, the force of this particular flood that comes, uh, that is induced by the climate change. So, when we talk about Pakistan being uh, among the top 10 countries which are most vulnerable to climate change, and it is because of the fact of the development that happened in the developed world, and that's not uh, the stance that Pakistani authorities take forward. It has uh, been said by the United Nations Secretary General himself also uh, while he was here on the visit during those uh, floods of summer 2022. So at the same time, of course, there, uh, there are a lot of things which have to be looked into inwardly but there is at the same time the responsibility of the international com uh, community as well when it comes to uh, the developing world getting the climate justice not as a matter of charity see the climate justice is again a moral argument the world does not operate on moral arguments i mean very recently i mean 30000 people have been killed in the in in, in in palestine and the world has not blinked an eye on this so, I mean, climate justice, the, the developed world is not willing to accept historical responsibility because that will open the floodgates. Then you will have uh, historical responsibility for slavery, you will have historical responsibility for colon colonialism. So, historical responsibility, as far as I think, is a no-no. <coughs> they will continue to give whatever they want to give as charity, not as justice. So because, uh, I mean, again, international... Uh, okay, how, do you, see, how do you see the establishment of the loss and damage fund? It was spearheaded by Pakistan. I that mean, initiative it, has, it has taken, I mean, now we are uh, somewhere in COP28 or something. It has taken 28 years of uh, negotiations. Even now, it is, is a uh, wishy-washy thing, this uh, loss and damage fund. So because the developed world will continue to pull, uh, I mean, it, it's, its weight. So... Unfortunately, you need to see it realistically. I, I think it's not going to go anywhere. All right, uh, Ms. Naila, when we talk about the mechanism <laughs> uh, that has been evolved, that is part. Is there any concrete mechanism when it comes to one party, if it violates the provision of that bilateral mm. treaty between Pakistan and India, what is that mechanism to resolve the differences and disputes? Well, uh, taking the point further from Akif Sahab, uh, I mean, real politics is very much there. That's true. Uh, in-house, uh, you know, cleaning is also very important. Uh, we can, uh, I can give my views on that also, but the question that you have asked, uh, there are mechanisms. There is, you know, court of arbitration where you could go. And uh, we went to it, but you need two parties to go to arbitration uh, for it to be effective. Isn't and there a provision of either of the party? It in I Article 12G and F, these provisions are there. <coughs> so you can go to uh, Court of Arbitration uh, of the IWT, which is Indus Water Treaty. Uh, but the point is, there are a 
few lacunas in it. Firstly, uh, the World Bank, which was at that time IBRD, International uh, you know, Bank for Reconstruction, Reconstruction. and Development, uh, has not uh, taken its role as was mandated in the treaty. And they interpret that their job was only logistic and would not uh, therefore be uh, management. The fact of the matter is that even if logistics are maintained, the problem would not have aggravated to this level. So their lack of taking their responsibility has affected. And then India, as uh, Marisa said, has uh, always played a negative role because it wants to use a, you look at India, then don't only have problem with Pakistan. For us, you can say, okay, we are lower riparian, India is upper riparian. With Nepal, they have a problem where Nepal is the upper riparian state. India is the lower riparian state. But still, they have created problems for Nepal. You look at Bangladesh. India has problem with Bangladesh also on water. So uh, India's approach is extremely negative and destabilizing the region. And if they think that uh, they can uh, play that role of a regional power, pretending to be superpower, which I don't think they have the material for, uh, even to be a regional power, they first have to show that grace. A bigger country has a bigger responsibility in stabilizing the region, while India is constantly destabilizing. So, so if India doesn't show that particular grace, and the World Bank, as you already mentioned, it actually facilitated this, uh, this particular bilateral treaty between the two countries. So what's the way forward? If the objections by the Pakistani side continue to happen all along also, and India continues, especially as you already mentioned, that uh, after the revocation of Article 370 in IIOJK, mm -hmm. it continues to build more water uh, res uh, reservoirs over there. Uh, you see, even in 1951, when we started off on negotiation, uh, we continued. Then we had six years of constant negotiations before you had the Indo-Vos Treaty. It was not signed in one day and negotiated in one day. It takes time and we have to be perseverant. So the way forward is what Munir Akram is doing, that he is making the world realize. Because as I mentioned before, that the donor countries, whether when you spoke of uh, climate justice, that has in COP27 become part of official commitment of the global north towards global south. They cannot renege from it. And as a matter of climate justice, not as charity. Not at all. Which was categorically said by the United Nations Secretary General. Also. And also for Pakistan. Pakistan also said, we are not asking for charity, we are asking for justice. So that has to be uh, borne in mind. But coming down to what Akif Saab said, uh, you have a water policy, but you have not been able to implement it. You have not been able to implement agricultural reforms. And when you have political agendas, then that political agenda overwhelms the national interest. So I do agree with him that you do bring your home, uh, house in order, but at international level, you have to be perseverant. Mm -hmm. You have to stand your ground. You have to make the world understand the repercussions because it is not just Pakistan. There are so many countries which will be influenced by India's nefarious activities in the region. Going down to Maldives also. So uh, this is a very serious issue. It's a matter of lives and livelihoods, both. So this cannot be neglected. So you are of the view, uh, it is incumbent upon Pakistani authorities, especially the diplomats uh, who have that global outreach to keep sensitizing the global community in that particular regard. So uh, naturally, th uh, the authorities would be looking forward to a sort of an outcome after sensitizing the global community to any sort of a particular effect in order to make India abide by what it had agreed to, especially when it comes to the implementation of this particular treaty, <coughs> as uh, per this statement that Pakistan adheres to it, Pakistan aims to reinvigorate the Indus Basin system and uh, attaches great importance to its commitment towards this particular treaty, then what could be the possible outcome 
after that sensitization of the global community? Uh, sensitization uh, will affect, uh, will have effect because then those donor countries which have become complacent uh, would realize, just like in Palestine, you can see when the people came to the streets, that's when the politicians realized the repercussions on their vote bank. And then they started taking more positive approach towards Gaza. Uh, when people stand up, when international community, the com people stand <coughs> up, then the leaders also <coughs> realize it. We will continue our effort. The international community also has to play its part because now, as they say, it's a global village. If one part of the planet is affected, everyone is affected. And when you are going to COP28, you can imagine how serious the repercussions of climate change are already being, uh, you know, uh, estimated and uh, evaluated. And if serious action is not taken, it will take the whole globe into it. The whole planet will be affected. So I may say that my house is washed out by the floods, but tomorrow your house will also be washed out. So you can't remain complacent. Yeah. Uh, uh, right, uh, your point is well taken. What's the way forward, Mr. Ahmed, if mm -hmm. India continues to violate it and Pakistan continues to sensitize the international community, but there has to be a concrete outcome mm -hmm of all this particular exercise that Pakistan continuously at the international level continues to do so? Uh, there are two things that we can do. One is uh, we can uh, keep on uh, sensitizing the international forums and trying to exert our pressure on them and asking them to like curtail their uh, uh, relationship or like uh, the uh, funding uh, to uh, India if possible, if we can exert pressure. Uh, and uh, I hope like uh, on the humanitarian basis, if uh, we can inculcate some awareness uh, across the border, then it would also, uh, you know, uh, but I don't see like uh, such kind of uh, uh, initiatives would uh, really take uh, any uh, positive uh, turn for uh, Pakistan until Pakistan try to manage its own resources what are available. For example, like if uh, we cannot manage the flood water, for example, or like uh, the damage that uh, is caused by the flood water, one. Secondly, as uh, uh, Ambassador Naila mentioned about uh, national water policy, that was approved in uh, Feb 2018, or March 2018. And uh, till the day, it is just shelved, and it, it is dusting, and uh, we cannot take even one point of uh, the national water strategy ahead. And we were just unable to uh, implement. And uh, that uh, water strat strategy, national water strategy is just like uh, several check dams and other resources and uh, uh, keeping the uh, water resources, you know, intact and uh, making their pathways uh, to and uh, trying to, you know, uh, putting several mechanisms to manage the water or uh, in the uh, water, f uh, water availability in the uh, dry season, but unfortunately we cannot. But uh, this does not mean the internal mismanagement uh, does not really uh, mean like uh, we uh, shall uh, not uh, uh, pressurize India or we uh, shall not, uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, keep on uh, sensitizing or pressurizing the international forums uh, that uh, what injustice India is doing. I think we shall keep them on and also like those uh, uh, um, so institutions, the they are responsible for uh, development funding. We shall pressurize them that they uh, should conditionalize their, uh, the uh, funding that they give to uh, India for certain development projects. Uh, so that way I think uh, it may so uh, help. But what are the dangers if you would like to shed light in blunt terms when it comes to the violations of India and the kind of uh, the water terrorism it is involved in against Pakistan, what are the major dangers and the threats, uh, especially when it comes to regional security, peace, and ultimately that might lead into international peace and security? Transboundary water conflicts certainly uh, uh, would uh, uh, create uh, more uh, uh, non-traditional security threats for Pakistan. And it would, uh, 
uh, create uh, maybe like uh, some uh, strategic uh, co uh, conflict or enhance the strategic conflict between the two countries. Well, and secondly, like when we don't have water, and uh, uh, if uh, the people are so uh, up to their uh, nose, like uh, it is because of India, and uh, they might have certain, uh, I don't know what type of uh, uh, step they would take, but certainly it would have uh, uh, a transboundary, uh, uh, you know, surety in the transboundary uh, conflict. So, uh, and even uh, if uh, you see uh, the reaction of the Muslims in within the India, they might have uh, more uh, vocal voices for it because they, they are, are part being of us. They are, yeah. Yeah. There is a huge ramp uh, rampant discrimination against yeah, them that going is, on. That is. Since the BJP came into power yeah, back in 2014. Yeah. The type, uh, uh, so do you think, oh, as you already mentioned, that one of the possible solutions to this particular problem uh, could be the humanitarian appeal yeah. across the border on the other side of the border? Do you think that's going to work out? At least uh, it would create a voice there. And uh, it may add uh, a little bit more like uh, if uh, we have certain voices coming out from India, it may pressurize those international organizations working with India on uh, certain uh, water development uh, things. And uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, China has already, uh, uh, they also have some conflicts with uh, uh, India. And I, I, I don't know what could be the mechanism, but uh, both conflicts can, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, con the, the conflict, the China's conflict with India can also help us because China is always very, you know, sporting to our and uh, they also have some, uh, uh, you know, um, bilateral uh, deals with India and uh, China can also press uh, India for certain uh, uh, level of justice, water justice for us. Okay, so but so uh, uh, there are many s uh, lame type solutions, but not uh, if you see like uh, if we do something uh, this and it would concrete, uh, there would be a concrete solution to it. So if we talk we from will the perspective of Indians, well, as Ms. Naila Chauhan has already mentioned that India awards a new treaty. Mm. So uh, what is uh, the basis on the which uh, uh, it wants a new treaty with Pakistan when it comes to replacing that older Indus water treaty? Uh, basically they are interested like uh, to uh, grab uh, the entire water. They say that uh, it is mentioned in the that uh, uh, they can use the water as much as they can. And on the other hand, uh, after uh, having, because uh, the Kashmir uh, annex with them, and they believe like this is, uh, 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 the occupied Kashmir is uh, their part, and they can control all the resources. And they have uh, like also, uh, I, I would call like uh, uh, invaded uh, with their own uh, look, you know, uh, for the uh, demographic uh, changes and they are uh, building up uh, several uh, uh, infrastructure over there to control uh, the occupied uh, Kashmir's resources. So if they have uh, more water uh, control over there and they have dams over there, so, so there are, but I think uh, we need to keep on emphasizing on uh, the mediator, World Bank, right. and uh, other UN forums right. to uh, 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 have like um, uh, to cite Pakistan's stance for uh, because it's a matter of life and uh, livelihood for our uh, uh, people. Right, uh, Mr. Akif. Uh, now, both of our other participants are of the view, no matter how many problems are there internally, uh, uh, they need to be taken care of, of course. But at the same time, uh, we have to keep sensitizing the international community as to India's transigence and violation of this particular treaty. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm not a, a very good person in terms of international law because I don't envy the job of Pakistani diplomats. They're fighting a very uphill battle. India has the largest population in the world. It has exceeded China. It has the second uh, highest uh, foreign exchange reserves. And, uh, I mean, money makes the mayor go. So the global community, in spite of whatever they would, uh, the, the lip service that they would give you, they were deep down, they would be only interested in self-interest. The whole world operates in self-interest. I would just like to point out uh, one of the sentences which was spoken by the U.S. Secretary of State, Mr. James Baker, when uh, he was inaugurating the Hans Morgenthau Center at the University of Chicago. 
And he said that although we are a moral nation, but morality is no substitute to realism in international politics. Mm. So, I mean, there's abidance and there's violation. In between, there's foot dragging. So that's what you have uh, international lawyers for. If India can abide its time and... Uh, I mean, so then what's the way forward for Pakistan? The way forward for Pakistan is primarily, I think, uh, internal. We have not been able to even appoint a full-time Indus Water Treaty Commissioner for the last 10 years. We are, we are just making do with one person who is also the Joint Secretary in the Ministry. So, I mean, at least we need to put our house in order before we appeal to the world. And India has uh, not only the real world pressure on its side, but also climate change. India would say that the treaty has become uh, outdated because at the time it was signed, we did not have climate change as an agenda. If we have got the glacier melt, they also have the glacier melt. So, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't have uh, an immediate solution in mind. Uh, right. Uh, Mr. Naira, what's your understanding? You, when we, uh, you already mentioned why does India require a new treaty with Pakistan? Basically, uh, their whole idea is expansionism and domination. And like Muniz Saab said that they have problem with uh, China. Basically, if you look at these rivers, they emanate from Tibet. And India has a problem with Aksai Chin. India has been creating problems in Tibet for China with this objective of strategic, uh, you know, hold on these resources. And that's why they're creating this problem. Why is India wanting to review the uh, agreement? Because they want to have total monopoly. And they want to stifle m Pakistan. Uh, they want to stifle Muslims, uh, whether in their country or in their mm. neighborhood. So uh, India uh, at this moment is like a bull in a china shop. And they have no uh, respect for others. But we have to stand our ground. We have to defend our position. We have to put our house in order. We can go for drip irrigation. We can do so many steps. Mm you know, make canals cleaner, deeper, so the water flow is greater. But having said that, you still need to have the flow of the water from its uh, source to its uh, end user. As mutually agreed. As mutually agreed. So that we have to stand our ground. We have to negotiate. We have to create awareness. We have to expose India. We have to create awareness and sensitivity in uh, the global north. Right, uh, Ms. Naila, now, um, unfortunately, we're short of time. There are a lot of different diverse aspects to be discussed in this particular um, uh, show. But uh, regarding uh, an urgency that has been um, urged upon by uh, Pakistan's permanent representative, the international community by redu of, of reducing uh, the emissions by 43% by 2030 and also going towards getting that funding of $1.5 uh, trillion for the transition to clean energy how crucial is that that is crucial and i think that's what was main focus in the cop 27 also so he is basically reiterating uh, the international community's commitment made in cop 27 because if you see the last uh, cop uh, that was about implementation the ideas had already been discussed so in <coughs> cop 28 it is about implementation and now the world is pressing that the Global North fulfills its commitment to Global South and um, climate justice should be implemented. The pledges made should be uh, given as yet even the pledges made uh, in Geneva to Pakistan have yet not been sent. So uh, they are hoodwinking their responsibility. They cannot do that. So uh, whether they say the going back to history is a no-no, going back to history is yes, yes. And now you have, uh, you know, uh, uh, scholars and philosophers like Achele who are talking about necropolitics, which is going back to how colonial mindset has exploited the world and brought it to the level that it is in now. So the global north has to take its responsibility. Uh, right, Mr. Ahmed, uh, in a very ideal situation, if India starts adhering to the treaty and uh, the things on that front come into very much line, but at the same time, due to the climate effect, 
the glaciers up in the north in Pakistan are melting at a very rapid pace. Uh, so how to deal with that problem? Uh, th there are a couple of things that uh, we could do. Uh, one is uh, we have to uh, manage uh, the globe phenomena as uh, we uh, may learn from Nepal. Uh, they have uh, so many uh, uh, globe lakes like uh, uh, the uh, water of, 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 uh, coming from the glacier melt and uh, they are uh, managing their uh, globe phenomena and it is not uh, very uh, dangerous as that uh, uh, we have in uh, our northern areas. Uh, Shishpar uh, Lake always burst and it damaged like the entire infrastructure um, on the uh, way to the sea. Uh, this is the one thing that we uh, try to uh, learn the management. And secondly, uh, consistently we need to uh, uh, we need to launch a consistent water diplomacy for Pakistan. And based on the national water policy that we approved in 2018, and that is very comprehensive national water policy. And uh, on b because uh, we usually off and on, uh, we uh, project such kind of issues globally, like when it comes to certain forums. But uh, I think a consistent policy what your uh, diplomacy? Your, your point is well taken. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're short of time. Uh, Mr. Akif, if, if you have some last closing comments to make, please mm -hmm. go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Sayyid Abu Ahmed Akif, former Climate Change Secretary of Pakistan, thank you very much for being with us on the show. Mr. Munir Ahmed, water and climate advocacy expert, thank you very much for your time for being with us on the show tonight. And Ms. Naila Chohan, former Ambassador and Special Secretary on Foreign Affairs, thank you very much for your time also for being with us on the show tonight. Really appreciate that. With that, we come to the end of today's episode. Till the next one, take care.